you that um, many of you know the Akaha family, uh, Kenny, uh, Kalechi, Naomi and Tim and uh, his wife who is still in uh, Nigeria and his youngest son. Um, as you heard those words, acknowledge that uh, this family who is kind of split up at the moment still has part of their family in Nigeria and it's a great burden for them all the time. And, uh, we, and they have a great burden for their home country of Nigeria. So um, many of you know them, they're online today. I saw Kenny as one of the, um, one of the connections on Zoom. So it's good to see you brother and, and the family. And uh, just please keep that family in your prayers as well as you can hear the sort of burden that they would have for their home country of, of Zambia. Ways that we can help is um, get behind uh, ministries like Voice of the Martyrs that are helping uh, those who are persecuted in countries like, uh, like Nigeria and other countries as well. Um, open your Bibles to Jeremiah 29. We are going to pray. And then as soon as we pray, we will uh, have a look at this uh, in, incredible text. Lord, we just do pray. We pray for Kenny and uh, his family. And we just ask, Lord, that you would bless them and give them your peace as they consider what is happening to uh, their home country. And uh, Lord, we just pray that you would, um, you would uh, just uh, keep keep them uh, in your constant peace and comfort, knowing that you are in control. Lord, we, we pray that today, as we look at this text, that you would uh, open our hearts and our ears and our, our eyes to your truth as we consider uh, living an exilic life as we live as Christians in this world. And we ask, Lord, that we would give glory to Christ in all that we see and say and do that we find in your text of your word. We ask this in your name. Amen. Any of you go 10-pin bowling? Does anybody do it? Anybody? Nobody does it. Nobody goes 10-pin bowling. Have you gone 10-pin bowling? Yes, okay. There's, oh, yeah, there's a few now. Yeah, okay. And if you go bowling, um, so it's just bowling, all right? You know it as bowling. If I say bowling in Australia, people think it's like that lawn bowls. You know the British lawn bowls? You don't even know what I'm talking about, do you? Okay. You just know bowling is bowling. Just, all right, start over. Anybody go bowling? Right, yes, heaps of people. <laughs> I don't go often. When I do, I do like it. I, I do enjoy it. Um, the experience of bowling is fun, except for a couple of experiences. That's putting your fingers into the hands of those balls and putting your feet into shoes that a thousand fingers and feet have gone into before you, right? It's not very COVID friendly bowling, is it? But um, no, apart from that, I love kind of sliding down those wood panel floors and flinging a ball with all my might into crushing 10 pins into oblivion at the end. That's if my ball gets there. Because often when you bowl, well, when I bowl, maybe not so much you, uh, you know with bowling there's this narrow, I think it's narrow, this narrow straight lane that goes all the way down to the pins. And on either side of that lane, if your ball goes that way, it inclines that way, it can go to the edge and it can fall off into this very demoralizing thing called the gutter. Right? There's a gutter on either side. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? Yes. It's demoralizing, just the very fact that it's called a gutter. It, it kind of makes the description for you. You know, when somebody says, how was your bowling tonight? Well, it was in the gutter, right? It just tells people, you're not very good. That's where your ball ends up. And so often I feel demoralized about my ball going into this gutter. And then there's this four-year-old kid in the next lane to me. And this kid gets to bowl his ball. But instead of, like mine, going into the gutter, he gets these little guardrails that come over. Have you seen what I'm talking about? Those little guardrails that come over and he gets to bounce his ball off the guardrails all the way down and get a strike while mine's in the gutter. It's not fair. Get a little bit jealous of that four-year-old kid. I want to go bowl in his lane. Sometimes you need guardrails. Sometimes I, in life, and you, living in the pressures of exile as Christians, not in a home that is really the home that is our own, which is with Christ and in eternity with Christ. Often we need guardrails to keep us on the lane. We need to be helped, 
And we've been starting, we've been discussing this idea of exile, Christians living in this world, as we really do live as exiles in a home that is not our own. We do live, if you are in Christ, you are an exile in a home that is not your own because our home is with Christ and with Christ for all of eternity. Some of you have said, yeah, okay, I, I get that we are exiles in this country and actually it is now that we're starting to feel a little bit more and more like exiles, aren't we, as we see you know, pressures from our society increases in a moral revolution that is not God's morality, uh, abortion and other areas that are increasing. So as we look, we see that there are enticements, there are things that can force us, pressure us towards the gutter on either side of life in this world. Sometimes it's just our own hearts. Our own hearts often want to seek the things in this world and distract us from our real home. Sometimes we are just tempted by the external things around us in society, the sinful culture in which we live in, and we are tempted by it. And it's not only the temptations towards sin from us and the external temptations, but it's also the fact that we are facing a worldview that is different to our worldview in our culture. We have a morality and a concept of truth that is so opposite to the morality and concept of truth in our culture. We have a, a different, completely different purpose in our life to our culture. And because of that, it also seems to be an increasing antagonism in our culture and in the world as a whole toward the narrow message of Christ and his biblical truth. So many Christians, as you heard from Roger this morning about Nigeria, but we could have mentioned many different countries last week, India. So many Christians around the world are already coming under uh, an, an intense, a more intense type of persecution where they are even facing death. Now, some of us are wondering what is going to happen in our society? What will happen? Will persecution towards Christians increase? And how is that going to be seen? And we're waiting to see how that is. And part of this series is not being scared about that, but it's being prepared, preparing our hearts to live truly as exiles in this world, as every Christian is. And so we want, we want to live for Christ. And so here is the question this morning, how do Christians persevere in our faith as exiles living in a world opposed to Christ? How do we stay on track in Babylon? Because this whole world is Babylon. Well, sometimes you need guardrails. Sometimes you need guardrails to keep you going the right way down the lane as you travel towards home, our inheritance, our eternal inheritance in Christ. And so this morning, we're going to look at those guardrails in Jeremiah chapter 29. And this is a letter at least a, a large part, part of it, is a letter that Jeremiah is sending from Jerusalem where he is to exiles in Babylon. Let me give you a quick recap of last week. Last week, we learned where God was instructing the exiles about how they should face life as exiles in Babylon from this letter from Jeremiah. And they should face being there. Jeremiah says, God says through Jeremiah, that God has put you there. I have sent you there, God says. So this is under the sub sovereignty of God. Everything, including their exile, including everything that they are going through, is in God's control. And that's what we love to hear. If we're going through a bad time, you don't want to hear that God's not in control, do you? God is in control. And then secondly, they should face being in exile. In exile, he says, live for the welfare of the city. And that city is Babylon that they should increase in number in that place and carry out God's mission for the nations, even as those under his judgment, God is chastising his children, putting them in exile. But even while they are there in that way, they are to live for God according to his mission for them, that it was there all along to go out and be a light for the nations. And now they are to be a light in among, living among the most powerful and dangerous city in the world. And God has put them there for the good of that city. But God has also put them there for their own good. God was utilizing their, diffi their difficulty in exile to turn them back to him. They were a disobedient people. 
And God had brought them into exile so that they would turn their hearts back to him. They would call out to him. They would seek him with all their heart and be found by God. And in doing so, there was an incredible promise that God gave them. And this promise was so beautiful. Let me read this promise to you from verse 10 and 11 in Jeremiah 29. Thus says the Lord God, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. After about a generation of them seeking God, turning to him, doing what he's asked them to do, God will bring them back, back into his inheritance. Verse 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. So they are not in exile because God is evil or is doing evil. <laughs> they are in exile because God is good. Sometimes we think, why am I in this place? Why am I where, where I am? And we question the goodness of God, but God has us there. His plans for us are for good, not for evil. And so God has them there for good, all things working out for the good of his children. So these people are to live out 70 years, 70 years, a whole generation in Babylon, on, and they are to live and work through that, persevere in that time, according to the promise that God has told them. And what is that promise? I'm going to bring you back. Turn to me, seek me with all your heart call upon me and I am going to bring you back. There is a promise that you can keep reminding yourselves about for 70 years while you live in this situation that's going to keep you going and persevering in this time as exiles. So we come now to the second half of chapter 29. That was last week. We come now to the second half of chapter 29 today and I want to put to you that we go in having one of the guardrails on our lane of exilic life already in place. And that guardrail is the promise of God. Whenever we remind ourselves of the promises of God, it helps us to, st to stop straying into the gutter. You know, when we are pressured and we, and we remind ourselves, hang on, God has promised me this. It's something that I can keep living towards. It's something that I can, whoop, I'm going to bounce back off. I'm going to remind myself of this promise and I'm going to bounce back off that guardrail of promise and I'm going to stay in the lane until I get to the destination. Guardrails are important for us in life, and God puts them in the scriptures. And two guardrails, and we've talked about this before in this church, and I see it very definitely in this text in Jeremiah 29, two guardrails that God puts in place for us to keep us on track are promises on one side of the lane, and on the other side of the lane, there are warnings. Last week, we looked at more about the promises the promises that God has a future and a hope for his people, that he will return them home, that they are to live for that. And that's a beautiful guardrail in our place so that when things are getting tough, we can remind ourselves of the promises of God and they keep us persevering in our faith. But so do warnings. And so this morning when I read the last half of chapter 29, you were thinking, not very encouraging texts, Steve. And I want to put it to you that they are there because it is an encouragement to us. It is an encouragement to us to stay on track, brothers and sisters. It's an encouragement to us not to go astray. It's an encouragement to us to heed the warnings of God so that in the promises and the warnings, we keep on track. And so today, today I'm, I'm going to emphasize the warning. And I want you to hear... By the end of it, as we, as we think about promises and warnings together, I just want you to hear that to faithfully persevere as exiles in this world that sometimes is difficult, we know all the pressures that are there, to faithfully persevere as exiles, we need to keep within the guardrails of God's promises and warnings in Christ. We need to keep within the guardrails of God's promises and warnings in Christ. Now, the first half of 29 was more about those promises, except for two verses, and I want to read those two verses again because we skipped over these two verses last week. And so this week I want to look at these two verses which are warning to us and then are explained further in verses 15 onwards. And here are the two verses in verse 8 and 9 of Jeremiah 29. For thus says the Lord of hosts, listen to this warning. There was a beautiful promise about bringing you home, but listen to this warning. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets 
and your diviners who are among you deceive you. And do not listen to the dreams that they dream, for it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, declares the Lord. So what I firstly want to put to you this morning as we consider this, and just heed this statement as, as, I, as I was meditating on this text this week, and just, whoa, there is a, 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 there's a very solemn and important prom, uh, warning for us, and that is don't follow false teaching that will distract you as exiles from what you most need. Don't follow false teaching that will distract you as exiles from what you most need. Well, the question is, as we, as we hear that Jeremiah in verse 8 and 9 says that there's false teachers and they're saying false prophets and they're saying things that he did not send them to say, what is it that they are saying? We, we, we want to ask that question. And I think we get an indication of that in the last half of chapter 29. But I also want to put to you, just read through the whole of Jeremiah, read through the whole of the book of Ezekiel, and you will see this come through as a very prominent theme right through in both books. It was the false prophets who were misrepresenting the purpose of God. The purpose that God had for his people by saying, listen, I'm going to take you into exile. You're going to find peace not, not by fighting against Babylon and not by trying to stay in Jerusalem. You're going to find peace by going where I put you and by turning back to me. So the false prophets were misrepresenting that purpose of God. They were misrepresenting that, and they were saying, you would find peace by not going through exile. The false prophets were saying, you're you're not going to have to do this. We're going to be in this city, Jerusalem. And they they were telling people to rebel against Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon, whereas the Jeremiah and Ezekiel were saying, hey, listen, you need to give in here. You need to submit. And so it's almost as if they're saying, Something like this, these false prophets are saying, we are God's people. We are Israel. Regardless of whatever state our hearts are in, listen to that statement, because that's a very, very important statement. Regardless of whatever uh, aspect our hearts are in, whatever state our hearts are in, there is no way that God would ever put us into this situation. That's what those false prophets were saying. See, they are completely rejecting the notion that they could be in exile for 70 years or that they should submit to Nebuchadnezzar. So Jeremiah warns the exiles, don't listen to these false prophets who are opposing God's purpose for you. God is putting you there so that you will turn back to him and be a light, a shining light in the world for him. Now, the explanation of this warning is is really starting from around about verse 15. And when you start reading in verse 15, you start thinking, wow, this actually sounds pretty good. It doesn't sound bad because because it says that they are saying, hey, God has raised up for us prophets in Babylon. This is what the people in exile in Babylon are saying. God has raised up for us prophets in Babylon. And isn't it a good thing that God raises up prophets? Isn't it a good thing that God raises up people who would speak the word of God? The only problem is that they are not speaking the word of God. They are not the prophets that God raised up. It's not their their false prophets. God did, by the way, raise up for them a prophet in in Babylon. He was sent in exile with them, and that's Ezekiel. We're going to hear more from Ezekiel in a little while. But Ezekiel wasn't saying the same thing as these prophets. Both Ezekiel and Jeremiah were saying, God has put us here for a purpose to chastise us so that we would call upon him, that we would come back to him, that we would repent and put our faith in him, and that we would be a light to these Gentiles in in which we're we're living. So the false prophets were not speaking the word of God as true prophets do. And they were saying what they wanted to say and what the people wanted to hear. They were preaching, have you heard this statement before? A peace that is no peace. Have you heard that statement? Have you read that? They were preaching a peace that is no peace. That statement is in, you'll see that statement in Jeremiah. You'll see that type of statement in Ezekiel. They were people pleasers. They were, people, they were preaching what people wanted to hear. They didn't want to be in Babylon. They wanted to be in Jerusalem. Jerusalem, okay, you're going to go there. We just have to, you know, defy Nebuchadnezzar and, and, and live in Jerusalem. We have to engage other countries to help us beat and defeat this, this place and, and go back to Jerusalem. 
So in verses 16 to 18, then God has this incredible thing that he, he says. He says concerning Jerusalem, concerning even the king in Jerusalem. And, and it's amazing that it's there because you've got these exiles in Babylon. They're looking at Jerusalem. They're hearing about the Jerusalem and there's still people in Jerusalem. There's still a king. It says concerning the king of David that sits on the throne and concerning all the people in Jerusalem. There's still people in Jerusalem. Just the fact that there are still people in Jerusalem makes them think, hey, they're, they're still there. We're going to go back. We're going to go back because they're still there. There's still people there. And But God doesn't doesn't give them that hope about Jerusalem. Yes, there's still a king in Jerusalem. Yes, there are still people in Jerusalem. For the most part, most of those people are rebelling against God, not willing to submit to his chastisement and and to Nebuchadnezzar. And their continued disobedience, the whole city of Jerusalem, it's going to be ravaged. Look look at the, the description in verse 18. There's going to be sword and famine and pestilence, which there was. I mean, a siege brought out all of that. That all happened. They will become, and look at these words, the people who are living in Jerusalem will end up becoming a horror, a curse, a terror, a hissing, a reproach among the nations. It will be devastating. Why? Why? Well, look at verse 19. We get the answer. Because... They did not pay attention to my words, declares the Lord. My words that I persistently sent to you by my servants, the prophets, the true prophets, but you would not listen, declares the Lord. They did not listen to God's warnings. God's warnings that are consistently through the prophets. Repent, stop your idolatry, turn from that and turn to God. They didn't listen to those things. They didn't listen to what God had in store for them. They did not heed God's purpose to take them to Babylon. So they said, no, no, regardless of whatever God's doing, whatever, whatever God's prophets are telling us, we will, we, we, would, uh, we will not do that. See, God's purpose for them was so that they would go to Babylon to turn their hearts to him. And instead, what did they do? Stand in defiance. In really, for, for those people in, in Jerusalem and Israel, they stood in a misplaced sense of Israelite patriotism and rebelled against God. It was about my nationality. It's not about my heart before the Lord. That's a big problem. And they rebelled against Babylon. And that's actually a large portion of the whole message of Jer- Jeremiah. It's a large portion of the whole message of Ezekiel. If you read it and you see those, t- those statements, what it really says, if you read Jeremiah through, just, just get a normal flavor of it as you read the text, brothers and sisters, it's something like this. You do not have right of way to the protection and blessing of God just by calling yourself an Israelite listen for us just because you're a christian that doesn't mean that your living conditions are the priority over your heart before the lord it's the same for israel there right doesn't mean your living conditions you you have the right to say this is how everything should be and not have any concern about your heart and and that really is the message that we see coming through jeremiah and even in ezekiel So in verse 20, God announces that he is going to put the exiles in Babylon straight. He says, hear the word of the Lord. Listen to what I'm going to say to you, because you got it wrong. And now God deals with those so-called prophets. And we get an example of three prophets, two and then one. And so let's look at the first two. Look at verses 21 to 23. That's actually in your bulletin, by the way, the text is there from here on. Verses 21 to 23 God mentions two prophets who seem to be uh, seem to have the same name as as Israelite kings, right? Zedekiah and Ahab, not good Israelite kings, <laughs> but they have those names. Their names are Zedekiah and Ahab. And God handed those two men over into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. Now, they obviously they were defying God, they were against what God was telling them to do, but they were obviously against Nebuchadnezzar too, because Nebuchadnezzar was very interested in these men, took them, and we hear that, that they were condemned to death. 
Uh, and in the context of the chapter, in the context of what these prophets were saying as a whole, it seems most likely because it says that these men were not speaking, they were speaking lies, they were not speaking the word of God. So it seems most likely that these men are also enticing the exiles that are around them under false promises. You're not going to live in Babylon. We're going to go home. We're going to go home. It's okay. You don't have to, you don't have to abide by all of, all of this. And they are punished severely by Nebuchadnezzar. And I wonder even whether their words are so vocal that they are inciting even defiance or rebellion against Nebuchadnezzar. Because they're used as a curse. And it's a curse that these exiles would use toward each other if, I suppose, they were angry with each other or warning each other. They would use it. And it's in verse 22. The Lord make you like Zedekiah and Ahab, who the king of Babylon roasted in a fire. Hey, you're going to be this way? Go burn in the fire. It's, it's like saying that, right? It's like they use that as a curse. Now, interestingly, one thing that is, is worth noting that um, the, the ancient Babylonian laws, they were often known as the Hammurabi Code. Have you ever heard of the Hammurabi Code? The Hammurabi, in the Hammurabi Code, um, you would be burned by fire for treason or rebellion against the king. That, that's in the Hammurabi Code. Now, I want to put to you that we also see in another book in the Bible where there is someone being burned be under that type of judgment for defying the king. In fact, three people are. You know who I'm talking about? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. In Daniel, these people are under the judgment of God for defying the king. And they defy the king because... He wanted them to bow down to his own statue, right? Now, there is a huge difference. Please hear me. There is a huge difference between these two men, Zedekiah and Ahab, defying God by defying the king, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego by obeying God by defying the king. Do you see that big difference? There is a massive difference there. And we should note that difference. And I want to tell you that the people should have known that these men were false prophets. Because part of it, that they were speaking lies that were not God's words. We see that. But also in verse 23, we also see that they were living adulterous, immoral lives. They were taking their neighbor's wives. So they were speaking people, speaking lies to the people using God's name and, and living unholy lives. And let me just say this to you, brothers and sisters, that a false prophet is easily detected. It really, truly. We can detect a false prophet because their words are not God's words and their lives are not God's life. Are not, is not God's holiness. That's, that's how we see a false prophet. And so eventually a, a false prophet is going to expose themselves. There, and, and let me suggest to you, uh, just please hear me on this. Unless you and I are constantly in the text of Scripture, unless you and I are constantly looking at, at the truth of God's Word, we ourselves will not know what truth is and we ourselves will not understand what a holy life in God is. And so we ourselves will not detect a false prophet. We need to be in God's word. This is an, I mean, I, I, I regularly want to just encourage you, please daily pick up God's word and be in it and see exactly what he is showing us in, in the truth of Christ, in the truth of his word and, and in the life that we are to live before him as his people. But, you know, false prophets might come, they might deceive some people, but look at the last words in verse 23 that God says, I am the one who knows, and I am witness, declares the Lord. Listen, you might be able to deceive people, but you will never deceive God. We will never deceive God. You might, I might deceive you as a pastor in front of you, but I can never deceive God who sees me and knows what I'm reading and, 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 and thinking and doing and, and preaching. God knows. And that's a reality. That's something that we should revere. 
It's not just, you know, oh, wow, you, you know, you, you're talking about a scary God. No, here, here is the reality. Yes, God is not a policeman. He's our king and our savior, but he also is the holy God of the universe who knows, right? And we should live before him. So we have two different types of prophets. We've got prophet Jeremiah, who lived uprightly before God and his people. And he says to the people, live well in Babylon for 70 years. And while you are there, come to repentance, call on God, seek him with all of your heart, and God will visit you and bring you home. Then you have these immoral false prophets who say, There's still a king and people in Jerusalem. The fact that they're there, we should go there. God wants you to defy Nebuchadnezzar right now and go home. And I want to give one more example before we consider what the big warning for us in all of this is. Look at verse 24 where we get the one other example of a false prophet, and that is Shemaiah the Nehalamite. And this guy sent letters from Babylon from being an exile in Babylon to the priests, particularly one priest, Zephaniah, in Jerusalem. Now, we know what he was saying, because if you look at verse 28, it tells us that Shemaiah's letters are in response to Jeremiah's statement that the exiles were to turn to God, that they were to live well for him in Babylon for 70 years. And he is completely, Shemaiah is completely against that. I will not do that. We are Israelites. We should be back in Jerusalem. And so he's among those who want to rebel against Nebuchadnezzar for a speedy return. Now, it seems that Zephaniah may even be a fairly new priest. Maybe he's replaced uh, another priest that was sent into exile. He's replaced a man by the name of Jehoiada. There is a Jehoiada who's a priest about a generation ago. I don't think it's talking about that one because it says he's immediately replacing him. It seems to be he's immediately replacing this priest Jehoiada. And so so Zephaniah, maybe he's a young, maybe he's a type of a a green sort of a a priest in charge, right? He's he's new in his position. And Shemaiah seems to be taking it upon his own shoulders to speak for all of the exiles in Babylon and tell, tell Zephaniah what he should be doing as priest in Jerusalem. And what should he be doing? Listen, you need to do something about Jeremiah. You need to shut this man up. How dare he say that we need to live well in Babylon? How dare he say that we need to call upon God with all of our hearts? We just need to be back there in Jerusalem. How dare he give you this this hope that you have to wait for 70 years to get? Now, now that we see everything that's going on, what's the warning for us? What is it for us in this that we need to see? I want to put, I just want to put this to you for a moment, as clearly as I can, because I think this can be very, very subtle. False prophets will all have one major thing in common, brothers and sisters. Hear this. They will establish your hope outside of your need to recognize your sin, repent, and turn back to the Lord in faith in him being the only way of salvation. They will say that there is a hope without repentance and faith in an atoning sacrifice being made for you. They will say that there is a peace when there can be no peace because there is no reconciliation through repentance and faith with the God of the universe. That's what they will do. They will seek for you a hope that bypasses you having to deal with the fact that you have a sinful heart before the God of the universe and are subject to his eternal punishment, which is righteous and good for us that we all deserve in an eternal hell. They will not preach those very truthful doctrines that are in the scriptures that we need to look at our heart and and before God, see who we are and seek his salvation through repentance and faith. They won't preach the gospel. It'll be a false gospel. And and how do I know that really this is the, the crux of what is happening here? Let me tell you, Jeremiah was continually lamenting, lamenting over the people of Israel, over what the false prophets were saying to them, over what was happening with them. And, and look, just listen to one of the lamentations of, 
of one of the laments of Jeremiah. In Jeremiah 2.14, as he's lamenting over what these false prophets are doing um, in, in Israel, particularly for the exiles. He says this, your prophets, Lamentation 2.14, your prophets have seen for you false and deceptive visions. Now, that's exactly what he says in Jeremiah 29, 8 and 9, by the way. That same thing. Watch out. Don't, don't fall into this. Why? Listen to what he says. They have not exposed your iniquity to restore your fortunes. They have not said the way to come back to all of the blessings and inheritance of God is through repentance of your sin and faith in Him. It is not, it is not just through you doing something to be able to get back without that. That is the only way back into God's inheritance. Through repentance of sin, through knowing your sin, through knowing the devastation of our sin before the all-holy God. But they have seen for you oracles that are false and misleading. So Jeremiah laments. Go read Lamentations 2. It's, you'll cry with him. It's not just Jeremiah. It's Ezekiel too. Ezekiel makes these statements. I want to, I want to, I want to give you an example from Ezekiel. He's right there with the exiles in Babylon. He's right there with them. And he's pleading for them to heed God's purpose for them, to use this time to repent, to call upon the Lord. And just listen to Ezekiel's plea. It's from Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 25 and 26. Listen to these verses. Ezekiel says to them, therefore, God says through Ezekiel, therefore say to them, thus says the Lord God, you eat flesh with the blood. That's something that they ought not to be doing as Israelites. They, they, they should not have done that. That was against God. You eat flesh with the blood. You lift up your eyes to idols and shed blood. Shall you then possess the land? Do you think you can come back to the land with unrepentant sin? Verse 26, you rely on the sword, you commit abominations, and each of you defiles his neighbor's wife. Shall you then possess the land? Here's what Ezekiel's saying. God will not, N-O-T, E-V-E-R, ever restore you to his inheritance and land with unrepentant hearts. You get kicked out of the land with unrepentant hearts. That's the teaching of Scripture. That's the whole teaching of the Old Testament text. You get kicked out of the promised land with unrepentant hearts. Ezekiel knows that there is no promise in Scripture whereby anybody can ever come into or be restored to God's inheritance in the promised land with unrepentant, faithless hearts. It will not happen. It's not a thing. Go, Please read, if you haven't read this week's blog, Hebrews, the author of Hebrews says the same thing about this and he uses Moses and the generation in the wilderness who didn't go into the promised land. He uses the same, he uses the same concept. For God to bring anybody into his inheritance with an unrepentant heart, brothers and sisters, would be completely against the holy character of God. And brothers and sisters, there is no, N-O hope for you and me outside of being serious about our own sin before the Lord and fully trusting in Jesus, who is the only one who could pay our debt to make us right by, with, with God by shedding his blood in our place. That's the only way. See, there are so many subtleties all around us today. There are so many subtleties from people who are claiming, they're claiming to be God's so-called prophets and putting our hope in situations that have nothing to do with acknowledging our sin and calling upon God's name for salvation. Oh, come to Jesus. And you know what? You'll feel good. You'll be a better person. You'll do lots of community service. That'll be good. Come to Jesus. And by the way, give me your money along the way and I'll give you a miracle. 
Come to Jesus and I'll heal your bad back. Come to Jesus. I'll fix your drug problem. Come to Jesus. You'll obtain control of your life. Come and you know what? At our church, come to Jesus. You'll feel accepted. And there's, this, this is a judgment-free zone. Now, I'm not saying that you and I should be judgmental. Okay? Not that, high, not that critical attitude. We want everybody to come. We want to share the, the love and the hope of Christ with everybody. But we also want to call sin a sin. If that means somebody calls us judgmental, then so be it. So be it. You see, your Messiah is not a therapeutic Messiah. We do not have a political Jesus. We do not have a health and wealth Jesus. We do not have a judgment-free zone Jesus. We do not have a feel better about yourself Jesus. None of those require you to face your sin and to seek redemption through your only saviour Jesus. None of them will enable you to enter the inheritance without your debt being paid for you by one who is sinless on your behalf. None of it. Don't allow false teaching to distract exiles from what they need most. I mean, th those are all messages that focus the church away from the preaching that keeps us on track. What, what if you and I were in the church in Nigeria today and we were facing horrible persecution from Islam? And of course... You know, we're going to come together, we're going to talk to each other about how do we, you know, do the best we can to protect ourselves? How do we meet in, in as, as a safe environment as we can possibly meet? We're going to, of course, we're going to have those conversations, aren't we? And, and I hope that we need to pray for them in wisdom in all of that. But you know what? What is going to keep us living in the true hope and security in this life, no matter what happens? It's the preaching of the cross. For the forgiveness of our sins, the reconciliation with God. And so we must have tunnel vision in our church to continue preaching Christ crucified. That's the only way that we stay on track. That's the only way that that really happens. You see, we need to keep with God's redemptive plan, purpose and promise for our life and for others to come on that lane with us. That's the lane we're on. And our hope is built not on rebellion against the city, not on the worldly circumstances that we're in. It's built, it's not on, on fighting for a false utopia. Don't let your ball end up in that gutter. Your hope is only built in the lane of God's redemption for us in Christ. That's it. So lastly, God's exiles will heed. Because this is a warning, and I believe this warning is there because those who are truly his exiles, who are truly his, will heed God's warning and seek to live well in Babylon. Look at verse 29, Jeremiah 29, 29. This letter gets to Zephaniah, Zephaniah and the other priests, but what does Zephaniah do? Look at what he does. Zephaniah the priest read this letter in the hearing of Jeremiah the prophet. Zephaniah knew that Jeremiah's message from God was different to Shemaiah's. So what does he do? He takes Shemaiah's letter, he goes over to Zephaniah and he reads it because this is in direct opposition to everything that I'm hearing from you, God's prophet. And Zephaniah, I believe, he heeded God's warning not to listen to false prophets. And he's still in Jerusalem. So he took this letter directly to Jeremiah, read it to him. And then through Jeremiah, God responded to all of the exiles in Babylon. Look at verse 31. Send to all the exiles. He didn't just send it back to Shemaiah. He sent it back to everybody. This man's a false preacher in your midst. You all need to be aware. So he sends it back to all the exiles saying, thus says the Lord concerning Shemaiah of Nehalem because Shemaiah had prophesied to you when I did not send him and made you trust in a lie. And then God says that Shemaiah and his descendants would be wiped out and they would not see the fulfillment of God's promise to return his people. Why? Because God's people only return to the promised land with repentant hearts. Are you hearing that message? Are you hearing that message? 
if we, if we are unwilling to repent and seek God with all of our heart, if we just want better cultural circumstances, if we just want better geopolitical circumstances, if we just want better health circumstances or whatever else, then let me tell you, you will not see the promised land. Salvation is in our sin being covered by the cross of Christ and us putting our faith in Him, turning from sin and putting our faith in Him. The very fact, though, that 70 years later, exiles did return from Babylon, what does that tell you? It tells you that people did seek God in exile, that they did turn to God, that they did come to Him and call upon God, and God was found by them, and the people of Israel did, in fact, live toward the promise of God, heeding the warning of God, and returned. Now, they didn't return in a perfect circumstance. They're still sinners. Read Nehemiah and Ezra, the books of the return, and you'll see that they were still sinners. But they did return, having repented of their sin and putting their faith in God. So as you and I live as exiles in our present Babylon, the world, America, Ohio, Cincinnati, whatever suburb you live in, and Hyde Park right here, we live as people who are not in our true home. But we are longing for Jesus to return, to fulfill his promise to take us to our eternal inheritance, aren't we? We're looking forward to that. And, and I want to put to you that we stay on course within the guardrails of promises and warnings. What happens? What happens if, if antagonism against Jesus rises to the degree that you and I, even in this country, could face imprisonment for calling sin a sin? You know, like homosexuality or transgender or abortion, euthanasia, eugenics, all of those things. That you and I could be in that situation. And, and, we're, and we're under the pressure because you, you do that, you help somebody with that, you could be ending up in jail. But what helps us to bounce across, off the guardrails instead of going, on to the, going into the gutter and, and, and making ruin of our, of our life of faith? What helps us? Promises and warnings. The warning helps us. Matthew 10, 33. When we don't want to deny Jesus or his truth, we remind ourselves, you know what? Whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. And then you go, bang, off that guardrail. Yeah, that's true. I don't want to be there. But then the ball comes over. But you know what? I want to work towards hope. I need, I need something to keep me going in hope. And then there's another guardrail. Boom, off this guardrail. Matthew 10, 32. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. Oh, yeah, Jesus is going to acknowledge me. He is never going to forsake me. I can trust in the Lord. I do not deny him. And I make sure that I live for him because he will never deny me. Warning promise. It keeps me on the lane doesn't it? Keeps me on the lane. So let me finish by giving you one beautiful passage with both promises and warnings. So today you can be encouraged as exiles in this world to keep on your lane, to persevere, no matter what. Hebrews 10, 35 to 39, just listen to these words. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has great reward. Do you believe that? Do not throw away your confidence, which has great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. Guardrail. For yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay. Promise. Bounce. My righteous one will live by faith. And guardrail, warning, boom, if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and persevere their souls, preserve their souls. That's what it's like to have saving faith. To persevere in exile, because brothers and sisters, saving faith is persevering faith. And that's missional faith especially in exile. Persevere 
in Christ, in the guardrails of promises and warnings. Oh Lord, we pray that we would heed what we heard today, that we would see the greatness of your promise and the wonder of the truth of your warning. And we would pray, Lord, that you would keep us in the promises and warnings that we need to be that we would stay on track, that we would be in the lane that takes us all the way to the inheritance that you have for us. Help us to see today so clearly that there is no entry into our inheritance with you without a repentant heart, without faith in you, Jesus, because of what you have done. So Lord, we pray that, that we would truly trust you and you alone for paying our debt, for rising from the grave that you will not forsake us, that you will not deny us before the Father when we put our faith, our persevering faith in you. We ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen.